Listeners, readers, I'm so glad you've tuned in. Welcome to the Fox page, where we dive deep into the very best of books. We end up with a slightly, if not a much better understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read just maybe a little bit better. I'm Kimberly Ford, best-selling author, one-time adjunct professor, editor, and PhD in Spanish and French literature. And for anyone out there who doesn't happen to traffic in rare books, Foxed Page might be something of a mystery. Foxing is simply the little dots, little kind of uh, discolorations that you see on the pages of very old, beloved books. And speaking of Fox Pages, check out the foxpage.com for a couple of different features. Two cents, where I predict within about five minutes via a video, whether or not you should or perhaps should not read a given title. There's also booked, which are itineraries of sorts with lists of books that you might want to read before or during uh, trips to many different places. There's also memory lane where no pre-reading required. You can just tune in for about 45 minutes of me talking about some of our old favorites, things like Harriet the Spy, Encyclopedia Brown, uh, you know, maybe even forever, that forbidden Judy Bloom. But today we are talking about the most incredible book, Nancy Mitford's The Pursuit of Love. So this book is incredibly charming uh, and I cannot wait to dive in. As always, I feel like I have a lot to say, but honestly today I really, really do. Uh, a few tips before we dive in. The lecture will be delivered in three chunks. Uh, the first segment, we will cover why I think you should read this book. We'll then do a brief um, bio of the Mitford sisters, uh, particularly Nancy. But the Mitford sisters, um, the in the... <laughs> If you're not on the uh, YouTube channel, you're missing these gigantic tomes, which are just two of the many, many biographies of these sisters. I always feel really bad for um, for poor Tom, the brother. There were seven Mitford uh, children, and this book right here is literally called The Six. So it was, in fact, the women who were more uh, you know, flamboyant and more uh, exciting and eccentric, but I do always feel a little bit bad for, for poor Tom. I don't even actually remember for sure if that's his name. That's how inconsequential poor Tom was. So we'll be talking a bit about Nancy Mitford and her uh, fabled family. Then we're going to dive into the text. In the second segment, we're gonna talk about the narrative stance. So this is what's called a first person peripheral narrator. Uh, I like to think of it as the sidekick narrator and it's a very good vehicle. It's very handy in terms of literary convention. And in this case, it's just excellent, excellent use of the narrative voice. We'll also be talking about the incredible dialogue and the unbelievable pacing in this book, the meeting out of information. In the third section, we're gonna talk about maternity, which I love a, I love a terrible mother in any novel, and, and this, is, this is one of them. Actually, there are a few of them in this novel. Uh, we'll be talking about maternity, humor, and then we're gonna be talking a little bit about this book as sort of comedy and tragedy. And then we will look at the close of the novel. So as I said, I have lots and lots uh, to cover, so I'm going to dive right on in. Why should you, in fact, read this book? There's so many reasons. The first and foremost is that this is a huge crowd pleaser. I have uh, given this lecture in the bookstore, and honestly, I don't think I've ever had so many people, except for I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. That was a real crowd pleaser. But this one, everyone was so taken by it. Um, quick note on Audible, by the way, a lot of people, when I ask if they've read a book, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I, I listened to it as if that is somehow like a lesser form of consuming literature. If you are someone who listens to books, which I do as well, absolutely embrace the Audible, embrace the listening. It's so delightful to be read to. We all know that it's very primal. Um, and and to be read to and have access to so many incredible, incredibly well produced and incredibly well done uh, novels on, you know, in the in the audio media is just unbelievable. So never, never be afraid uh, to admit that you're listening to books. So um, not only is it incredibly like a crowd pleaser, but it's this amazing distillation of an era. And I say an era, but it actually ends up spanning a bunch of eras. These young women, the Mitfords, so um, Nancy herself was born in, I'm looking at it right here, in 1904. And Linda, 
Rad Radlett, who's the heroine, is born in 1911. Um, Nancy is the oldest of all the Mitford kids. But she's born in 1904, which is just after the Victorian era. It's in the Edwardian era, right before the Georgian era. But these, because they're... <laughs> because their family life was sort of retarded by their father who was wanting to keep them at home and keep them uneducated and sort of keep them in the 19th century, their lives were often, um, you know, well, not often, their lives often seemed uh, sort of Victorian in some ways. So it's this incredible bridge with this like charming Victorian kind of roots, but then it goes all the way through the Second World War. So you have not only a distillation of, of sort of a Victorian childhood in many ways, but then you span through, you know, the roaring 20s and the, the bright young things and the sophistication and the kind of um, the optimism of that moment and then through uh, through the Second World War. Uh, I mentioned before that this book is incredibly charming and, and a pleaser. It's not only charming uh, in terms of just like straight up charm, which is there, it's also incredibly intelligent. So there's there's a lot of levity in it that, that feels very charming and a lot of details, but I will argue um, throughout today uh, throughout these three sections that that really what she's doing is very sophisticated and it can feel kind of light and frothy uh charming for lack of a better word when in fact what she's doing is very skilled and she's really trusting and flattering the reader to understand some pretty heady prose there's a real combination here again uh, people think of this book as being very light but one of the reasons why I think it has never been out of print and why it sold 200,000 copies in its first year of publication in 1945 is because it's this incredible combination of comedy, but also there's a lot of pathos. There's a lot of sadness and there's a lot of um, grief. And, and, and I think it's a perfect balance because it gives it enough weight to not feel like some kind of little confection. You know, this is not just some sort of beach read by any stretch because there really is a lot of emotion and a lot of, a lot of difficult emotions that are, that are treated, I think, very deftly. As always, it's incredible prose. We, uh, in the, in the, up here at the Fox page, we don't read anything that is not incredibly well written. And Nancy Mitford, because she was totally uneducated, her father, like Linda's father, did not believe in educating his, his children. I guess um, Tom, if that's his name, was off at Eton, uh, just like, uh, um, uh, it's not Matthew, just like the younger son in, in this book. But it, uh, the girls are not educated in any sort of formal sense. So there's some quirky grammatical things and there's some sort of quirky, there's just some quirky stuff happening with the prose that we're gonna look at and it makes it feel original and unique and I really love that about it. They, the girls all read widely and you can note a bunch of different influences, which we will not have time to get into, but I find it so charming because of the originality together with, with some incredible execution of very old, very uh, tried and true literary tropes. Okay, we're gonna dive into a quick, I mean, again, like given that a lot of people have devoted 700 pages to these people and Nancy Mitford being the most accomplished writer, uh, she really has, she does not have the lion's share of these because she has sisters who were crazy, but she really does, um, she's, a, she's, a very, she's a very interesting life in lots of ways. She was born in 1904, died in 1973. She was the eldest of the seven children. Uh, of the Baron and Baroness of Reedsdale. So their last name is Mitford, Freeman Mitford, uh, you know, hyphenated Freeman Mitford, but they were the Baron and Baroness of Reedsdale. So very much like of, of Alkenley in the, in the novel. Uh, she was married in 1933 to a man named Peter Rod, who is very closely uh, modeled on Tony Krasig. And she was divorced after 24 years of marriage in 1957. I think the blush was off the rose fairly early for those two. And she, in fact, had a, uh, a liaison, is how it is described in some places, with Gaston Paluski, who is the stand-in for Fabrice. Her sister Diana was uh, one of the fascists in the family. She, in fact, was married to Walter Mosley. She spent some time in, like, prison light, I think, um, you know, as sort of a political after after the Second World War and yet stayed married to Walter Mosley forever, Walter, Walter Mosley being a fascist. 
Her sister Unity, so that was Diana, very, very beautiful sister. Uh, her other sister Unity, also beautiful. Her name was Unity Valkyrie uh, Freeman Mitford, kind of a mouthful. So um, Unity was in fact literally a Nazi and was he, she attempted suicide a couple of times because she was very involved in the Nazi party and I think saw the writing on the wall and was like like actually a friend of Hitler. Like she was a, she caused a real rift in the family because as you can imagine, it was very hard for people to stomach Unity's uh, love and affection for the Nazis. Jessica Mitford, who wrote an incredible book, if you're, if you're sucked in to the whole Mitford thing the way that I am, and I am in deep, um, Jessica Mitford wrote this incredible book called uh, Hans and Rebels. So Jessica was the one who came up with Hans, Hans being kind of a bastardization of hens. They, she and her younger sister, Debo, wanted to have this society with the hens. And so they called themselves the Hans, which um, then Deborah, I mean, Nancy, a little hard to keep all these names straight, but Nancy thought it meant the honorables and the Hans cupboard then came from honorables. Although even I know that that is not an H that you would pronounce. So uh, I think I, it's, it's a little bit of a head scratcher why Nancy thought that Hans um, would be for honorable. Anyway, Jessica wrote this incredible book called Hans and Rebels, which was highly, highly autobiographical, one of these kind of meldings of biography and fiction. So, and Jessica was a communist, like a hardcore communist, and ran off with uh, her lover. He was like, I don't know, 19, and she was 17 or something like that, or se he was 17 and she was 19. They went off to Spain and fought with the resistance in Spain against Franco and the fascists there. She became a communist. And, and her lover actually was the grandson of uh, Winston Churchill. So they had a lot of attention following them. And at that point, the Mitfords were already a very big deal. So this is a family that literally, like when, when uh, Unity and Jessica shared their room, they had a line down the middle and Jessica had all of her like communist stuff all up on the walls and all of her, you know, her manifesto and whatnot. And then we had unity over here with all of her uh, Nazi propaganda. So it was a it was a colorful family, to say the least. And, and these are not just, you know, fads and sort of fetishes that these people have. They like really got in deep with people. Nancy herself in 1939 went to help uh, the Spanish in the Spanish Civil War. So she herself, uh, she said that she cried oceans, had never cried so much in her entire life, but had never been happier than in those weeks. I think it was three weeks or a month that she was down there with Peter Rod, her first husband, first and only husband um, in Spain. And she she's a moderate socialist. That's kind of how we classify her. But she she took those experiences and really molded them into Linda's experience in Spain. She suffered two miscarriages while she was married to her husband. And then she had one miscarriage, apparently with a French lover, not Gaston, but someone else. And that led to a hysterectomy. And I think um, the inability to have children was very difficult for her. And, and I think some of the we're going to talk in the third section about the maternity and how it is portrayed in this book. I think some of her her um, like pushing against maternity has to do with the fact that she wanted to be a mother and was not able to be. She worked in a bookshop, which I love, of course, Haywood Hill Bookshop and in England in yes, in London, and then also moved to the branch of Haywood Hill Books in Paris. She moved to Paris uh, soon. I, th I actually think she moved there before uh, the book came out in 1945, but she she lived most of her adult life in Paris very happily. And be sure that you actually do go to the Fox page and look at the YouTube uh, images that I have if you're not already on the YouTube channel. They're, they're the most incredible images. You can imagine how fun it was for me to research and accumulate these these images. Really, really uh, a good time. A lot of a lot of good visuals come along with Nancy and her uh, her life in general, but certainly with these books. So The Pursuit of Love is a trilogy. She writes, The, the Pursuit of Love, I think, is the strongest of them. But again, if you're like me and you're sucked in, you're going to probably uh, be interested to know that Love in a Cold Climate and Don't Tell Alfred are uh, the two books that follow this. They're both uh, narrated by our, our trustee, Fanny. And Linda is not in them, but we have Fanny uh, describing her marriage. And, and they're really, they're really, really great. They're just not quite as strong, uh, largely because it has a lot less radlets in it and, and much more of Fanny and her family. 
Uh, Nancy went on to write a, a bunch of really accomplished biographies. Um, one of the reviews, one of these English people said that it was marvelous entertainment, something like, you know, you can hardly call it history, but that it was this very entertaining kind of take on Voltaire, Voltaire in love, in fact, on Louis XIV, on Madame de Pompadour, and um, there's, there are a couple of other biographies. So she was a prolific writer and, and a huge Francophile uh, in, in the best of ways. Okay, we are now going to dive in. We're gonna take a look at uh, the cover art, the title, and then uh, the intro, the dedication, and the first couple paragraphs. So. I, I really, really love the photo on the front of this. And I don't, I don't hate this. I love pink. I don't, it's fine. It's fine. It didn't, it didn't like really grip me, but I do love this, uh, this photograph partially because the bust of Nancy's dress here. So this is Nancy Mitford on the front. The bust of her dress, um, is like, it's just such a funny way that it's fitting. And I love how that real, that makes her feel. And it's so funny. I mean, makes her feel real to me. Uh, and I have a, a, an image again at, in the YouTube channel um, of her with another strapless gown when she's a much older woman and it fits her in exactly the same way, which I think is so funny. Um, I think one interesting thing about the cover is that it really is inviting us to conflate Nancy with Linda Radlett, which I'm happy to do. And again, this is, you know, we have this American and British mania for, for, for knowing what is true and, and, and what is fictional. And in, in this case, it's definitely a novel and there, there's lots of sort of obscuring of people and lots of changing, uh, certainly of, of the bigger picture, the bigger uh, sort of denouement and the, and the bigger climax of this novel. But meaning that the climax is not what happens in real life to Linda, I mean, to Nancy herself. But there is um, this delicious conflation, and I think she's really inviting that by having this photograph of herself kind of as Linda Radlett on the front of the book. Again, she sold 200,000 copies of this book, and it has never been out of print, so there are lots and lots of different covers. I think this is a pretty good one, uh, as, as covers of The Pursuit of Love go. Okay, um, we are going to skip the forward and we're going to go right and the introduction although we're going to dip back in i like the introduction by zoe heller i thought it was good um we're going to pull a couple of things from it but we're going to move straight to the dedication so she dedicates the novel to gaston paluski uh he obviously is not obviously but it turns out he is the real life fabrice so he was the right hand man for um for charles de gaulle for the, for the, well, he was general, for the general, for General de Gaulle. And uh, he was the love of her life. There's this hilarious thing that she, she's very funny in, in lots of letters that she wrote when she was in France, she wrote constantly to all of her sisters who were all over the world. She did not write so much to Diana um, or Unity. There was, again, that rift um, that would happen in the fascist communist, you know, fault line in any given family. But she would say that she would, she always called him the Colonel and she would say, uh, I love you, I love you, Colonel. And he would say, that is so kind of you. So there, there's a lot of sort of self-deprecating humor, but, but I think Nancy really owned the fact that uh, she was in love with him. He was the love of her life. And yet for him, you know, he, he was a man who was married and then who also had a, a series of mistresses. So it, it was interestingly, she when it came out in 1945, this was the dedication, and that was not it, it was not a great move, and in fact caused some tension between Nancy and Gaston, because he was still very active with uh, General de Gaulle at that point, and you know this is immediately following the war, caused a bit of a stir. So I'm not exactly sure what Nancy's thinking there was, but you know sometimes a dedication will get you in some trouble. Okay. So we're going to dive into chapter one. Oh, we didn't talk about the title. So very briefly, I mean, The Pursuit of Love, it's, it's, it's very sort of straightforward in some ways. But the thing that I would note is that, um, you know, Linda Radlett is, is so, so determined to, to live a life of passion. And, and I think she does so very beautifully. And I think it's elevated to, to sort of this beautiful art form. I mean, it's really... Um, I think you walk away from the novel thinking that like a life in the pursuit of love is a life well lived. You know, I think you you do feel that. Um, but I also really love the idea of it being the pursuit of love. 
So the whole point is the pursuit of love. It is not, you know, happily ever after or a life of love. It is this idea of how the pursuit of love is really the thing that um, that's at the core of the novel. And in fact, in many ways is is uh, is Linda's sort of raison d'etre and also Nancy's in many ways. OK, we're going to dive into chapter one. There's a photograph in existence of Aunt Sadie and her six children sitting around the tea table at Alchemy. The table is situated as it was is now and ever shall be in the hall in front of a huge open fire of logs. Over the chimney piece, plainly visible in the photograph, hangs an entrenching tool with which, in 1915, Uncle Matthew had whacked to death eight Germans one by one as they crawled out of a dugout. It is still covered with blood and hairs, an object of fascination to us as children. Wow. I mean, that is a hell of an opening. Uh, it's not even, we're not even finished with the paragraph. This is just the very beginning of the paragraph. Amazing. So it's the, the beginning of the novel. It, for those of you who have finished it, you know, you're expecting a bit of a trifle from the, from the beginning. And, and, and I think from what we know, if you knew anything going into it, um, but, but really it begins in this very kind of elegiac tone. It's very, melancholy what she's about to tell us here and and in fact this idea of, of photographs as being very sad because everyone is sort of preserved in amber but that moment is over you know it's always it is always a, by definition you know a, 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 like memento mori it's always a, a, a reminder of the fact that that life is precious and moments are fleeting um but she's also doing such important work here so we have uh, at this point Aunt Sadie and the six children, which I thought was kind of mean because I thought that we were literally writing poor Tom out of the novel altogether. And we are not. There is, in fact, another baby on the way. Uh, but I love the fact that right from the beginning here, you have this open fire of logs. So like there's danger just abounding. I mean, this whole place of Alkenly, it's freezing cold. It's huge and vast and, and all. I mean, literally this this baron is hunting the children, which I just thought was so funny. So th there was this idea of um, of danger right from the start. You have the open log fire and then over the chimney piece. I love the mention of chimney piece. Because later he starts giving Fanny such a hard time, and um, Lord Radlett does. He, he starts giving her such a hard time because uh, she says mantelpiece. So he's saying chimney piece here. Well, in fact, this is our narrator, Fanny. Uh, but, you know, as an educated woman, she starts saying mantelpiece and note paper and all of these like egregious things. I guess you're supposed you say writing paper, lettering paper. I think writing paper. So over the chimney piece, uh, plainly visible in the photograph hangs an entrenching tool. So this idea of this entrenching tool is, is it's such a, a good mention, such a good detail, because in fact it is, um, it, it, well, because I'm, I'm going to explain it to you if you haven't already thought of all of these different, uh, you know, iterations and all these different implications. So the, the entrenching tool would have been used for the trenches. So, it, you know, you have this reference to the First World War, which is it, it, it's not a huge uh, it, it's not a huge preoccupation in the novel. And yet it's always a little bit in the background, this idea of having just come from this horrifying war that, you know, was was huge numbers of losses of lives and, and lots of uh, young men coming back with visible, you know, scars, not to mention all the, the shell shock. Uh, but she has you, you have this entrenching tool which, you know, it was known as trench warfare. So you have this real evocation of the First World War. You also have this idea um, of, of, uh, of Uncle Matthew as, as entrenching. Like he's he's constantly, it's so cute to me because he, he sort of draws these lines and, you know, makes a, a you know, a, a trench as it were. He's trenching himself into like a given argument or a punishment or whatever it is. And then they get the thin edge, I mean, the thin end of the wedge and they start sort of, um, you know, getting themselves back on on good footing with their father or uncle or whoever he is to them. But this idea of of this entrenching tool is very symbolic in lots of ways. Also, the idea of kind of the this landed gentry, you know, this nobility as as being entrenched and as Matthew as being sort of entrenched in this Victorian era and not liking progress and not wanting change and not wanting education. So this entrenching tool that we see again and again and again, 
is introduced right at the beginning and is very symbolic. Uh, then, of course, I love this idea that he, um, he whacked to death. Uncle Matthew had whacked to death eight Germans one by one. So this is one of the ways that we have this incredible um, combination of pathos and comedy. So whacking someone to death is very different because the word is just sort of goofy. It's it's a little slapstick. It's a little comedic. It's a little light. Um, you know what what he's talking. What Nan, what um, Fanny is talking about here is him in a very difficult situation, and yet because of this verb which, you know, gosh, verbs are where it's at, people. Anyone out there who's trying to write, just remember. Or when you're thinking about whether you like the way someone is writing or not as a reader, verbs, you really, really want to put a lot of thought into them. And and here's a very good example. It's very Anglo-Saxon. It's very um, also almost onomatopoeic. You can almost hear like the whack, you know, the, the noise that's being made by the entrenching tool. But he whacked to death eight Germans one by one, like we're having this kind of gruesome picture th that is a real point of pride for Matthew. And it, it, it's a plot point. You know, Tony Preissig is out of favor because he's German, blah, blah, blah. But you can understand that this was a time of, of, of tension in the world. And yet here it is rendered fairly light. And the fact that it still has the blood and hair. And then it's so excellent how at the end of this, this long-ish sentence, uh, an object of fascination to us as children. I mean, seems like it would be a bit of an understatement, but these the things that the Radlett children get so fascinated by are so excellent. I mean, there's the whole thing about, you know, when they're preoccupied with sex or they're preoccupied with hunting or they're, you know, they're, they're all these different things that they get sort of obsessed with. Um, but there's this measure of understatement here that we're seeing that's also just genius. Okay, then we're gonna, oh, also it's very important that, that Fanny is identifying herself here both as an outsider and as an insider. So in the very beginning, when she's talking about Aunt Sadie, we know right away that we're talking about someone who is a cousin of the Radlett children. So it's someone who is, I mean, again, this is the genius of the sidekick narrator, someone who's perfectly distanced to know everything that's going on in the house, but to have enough objectivity to share with us, with the reader, you know, sort of the strangeness and, and the kind of the novelty and the, and the weirdness that you might not see if you were a Radlett child yourself. Uh, but then at the end, when she, at the end of this little chunk, when she says to us as children, it's also very important that she be kind of inside the fold enough that, that she is treated as, as an intimate and as an equal to the children. It's, it's such a great narrative device. I mean, it really is very strong. Okay, then we're gonna jump down a little bit toward the bottom of the page. The other children between Louisa's 11 and Matt's two years old sit round the table in party dresses or frilly bibs, holding cups or mugs according to age, all of them gazing at the camera with large eyes opened wide by the flash and all looking as if butter would not melt in their round pursed up mouths. Couple of things. Um, I always thought that expression "butter would not melt in her mouth." I'm not sure if you've come across it. It's a, it's a big one in a lot of British writing, certainly from the nineteenth, eighteenth, and nineteenth centuries. I thought it meant that someone was very cold, um, but that didn't make sense here because these children are definitely not cold. I looked it up, and what it means, it's not cold or like mean. I thought it was like mean-hearted, so that like the person was very cold or distanced or or you know, yuck. Uh, but it actually means coy or demure, sort of that you're, you're hiding something, that you appear to be very, uh, you know, sort of innocent, and yet you, in fact, are, are harboring some real secrets, which made so much more sense to me. I also, it is the genius of Nancy Mitford to not just say, and a lesser writer would have done this, and usually the phrase reads, uh, that, uh, looking as if butter, looking like, looking as if butter would not melt in their mouths is sort of the, the normal phrase, but looking like butter would not melt, sorry, looking as if butter would not melt in their round, pursed up mouths. So there's this kind of, it's beautiful because all of them then are making the same kind of expression and all of them, you know, are very sort of, uh, you know, there are all six of them, soon to be seven. They're all kind of the same person with the same expression. So you have this reinforcement of them as a family group. The part that I skipped in the middle between these two chunks, I just have to touch on very quickly. It's Aunt Sadie and she's holding baby Robin. 
and uh, baby Robin is in oceans of lace and but but she's nanny's right close by and Aunt Sadie's sort of like, oh, my God. So I, I really love, again, the depictions of maternity. And we're going to look at those in the third section. But Aunt Sadie, who we're not really focusing on in the third section, Aunt Sadie is is kind of this like bemused, bemused, meaning like confused, kind of like like just befuddled and, and never can quite get her grips. It's like she's kind of a reluctant mom of seven. And she's also someone who is clearly leaning on, you know, her husband for discipline and nannies and, uh, you know, sisters and all of these other people to help her raise all of these children that she has produced. Okay, we're going to continue. There they are, held like flies in the amber of that moment. Click goes the camera and on goes life. The minutes, the days, the years, the decades taking them further and further from that happiness and promise of youth, from the hopes Aunt Sadie must have had for them and from the dreams they dreamed for themselves. I often think there is nothing quite so poignantly sad as old family groups. So again, this is, I mean, and, and this is Nancy Mitford talking very much about her own family. And, and it is a family who actually, John, John Tom, Tom, see, I can't even, I think that's his name. It's probably John, but he was killed actually in Burma, um, Myanmar today, maybe, My, Myanmar. Um, he he was killed, so he, he died as a younger person, which was very tragic for all of them. And then you have the schisms in the family and you have Nancy's sadness about not becoming a mother herself. You have the fact that she has a, a lot of relationships, romantic relationships, none of which is 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 really as fulfilling as what she what she had hoped for. So you again, you have this very elegiac, this very sort of um, fatalistic and sad tone. She literally says, you know, nothing so nostalgically sad. Is it nostalgically? I'm going to check that again. Um, but you have this idea of 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 uh, of the real poignancy. Oh, poignantly. <laughs> That's what she says, poignantly sad as a family group. Um, and again, it's not a family photo, it's a family group. So this idea of point, something being very poignant. So if you are, as I always counsel your readers to be, if you're paying attention, especially to the end of this incredible opening paragraph, because the end is always very important because it's what kind of lingers in our minds, subconsciously or consciously, um, that the ending is about sadness and it's about poignance. And so there is this sense of of um, of kind of foreshadowing and, and this nice hinting at the balance that we're going to see. So it's not just all fun and games, whacking people with the uh, entrenching tool. In fact, there is a lot of sadness that is going to come. Not that much sadness, though, for all of you who are really looking for something frothy out there. So I'm going to close there with the end of, um, oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not, because I am going to go through the names very quickly. Um, Fanny means free, uh, which I think is so funny. It can also, it comes oftentimes from Francis, meaning that you have been to France or, or has to do with France. Um, so that's a little bit less exciting than free. I did. I don't even know what this site was that told me that Fanny meant free. Fanny, of course, is also a um, a term. I don't know how long ago this was adopted, but a term for vagina, a, like a slang term. Um, so, which I think is funny. Linda means pretty. Linda and Nancy are, are, in my mind, very kind of you know in the same name family. Emily, I love this. Aunt Emily is known as arrival or laborious. And Aunt Emily certainly is kind of the worker bee of the family. She is the one who has taken on the Bolter's young, um, young Fanny to raise as her own. And Davy is beloved, which I loved. Sadie means princess. Um, Matthew is gift of God. Anthony, um, so Tony Kreisig, you know, presumably his, his full name is Anthony. Um, it can mean uh priceless this is so funny to me priceless or fancy like tony like the idea of tony some, if something is very tony it means you know that it's very like luxurious and kind of fancy and whatnot but the fact that anthony in some it can mean priceless is is just perfect because anthony krasig tony krasig is really only concerned with money uh and then i love the idea fabrice is known as a craftsman or as 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 fabulous. This is this is what the meanings um, of Fabrice are, and I love that idea because in many ways uh, Fabrice is a craftsman of this life for Linda. Uh, but well, 
it's actually uh, Lord Merlin who gives her the home, but but this sort of, you know, the, the happiness of, of their life together. He's, he's sort of the craftsman of that. And he also is a craftsman of, of the nation. You know, he is the one who's working uh, for the French. And also he is, of course, very fabulous. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there for our first section, but be sure to join us for the second and third to learn even more about Nancy Mitford's really great pursuit of love. <laughs>